the scientific discoveries continue to pour in, and this year has seen many. So here are 10 interesting scientific discoveries for June of 2025. Here we go. Number 10. Radio Astronomy on the Moon in February of this year, the IM-1 or Odysseus robotic moon landing mission done by Intuitive Machines successfully landed on the moon, but then only to tip over to a 30 degree angle due to some kind of unexpected lateral motion from the craft at the last moment. Despite this, the mission was considered a success. On this mission was an experimental NASA radio telescope known as Rolseys-1, which was not catastrophically affected by the tilting and it marked the first time radio astronomy has been done on the moon. The instrument consisted of four 2.5 meter spring-loaded antennae, two of which accidentally deployed during the landing, and over the course of a few hours measurements were made of both emissions from space but also radio emissions from Earth. The astronomical emissions were mainly the product of cosmic rays interacting with the overall magnetic field of the galaxy. It did detect them, but perhaps more interesting were the emissions from Earth. Earth's radio emissions were seen to twinkle from the moon, a product of the Earth's atmosphere distorting the transmissions. This actually has a connection with SETI because this twinkling effect may also occur with alien radio transmissions that originate on planets with atmospheres, as well as anything we send from the surface of the planet in MIDI. That may be useful information if we ever get any particularly strong SETI candidate signals. Unfortunately, the radio telescope only had enough power for a few hours before shutting down prematurely from lack of power. Had it lasted longer, it would have made observations of Jupiter's radio emissions, and those of the Sun, which is a shame because the instrument actually missed a solar outburst by about a minute. Number 9. Red Mars is Red for a Different Reason Than We Thought So there's no secret about the color of Mars. You can see it in the night sky. It's red and it's because of iron oxide. But previous thinking was that the reason Mars is the red planet is largely because of hematite, an iron oxide that forms in dry conditions that's very common on Earth. Any rockhound or jewelry lover knows it. But this now does not seem to largely be the case for the red planet after all, though Mars certainly has hematite. The culprit actually seems to be ferrohydrite, another iron oxide. But this one forms in wet conditions, giving yet another indicator that Mars in the past was a cold, but still wet, environment. Ferrohydrite likes cool conditions, with neutral pH levels to form as oxidation. How this work was done was that iron oxides, depending on the type, reflect light at different wavelengths. By examining data from all the Mars missions, the team involved discovered that ferrohydrite is the most common iron oxide component of the Martian surface. And this seems to have happened about 3 billion years ago, during Mars's Hesperian era. During this period, Mars was very volcanic, and it seems likely that would have caused ice melting and flooding, but also just before Mars started to lose its liquid water. Interestingly, further study in this might give details on what the water temperature was when the ferrohydrite formed, where the water generally came from, and potentially even if there were microbes active when it formed. Number 8. Unusual Medieval Book Bindings Found Books located in French monasteries from the 12th and 13th centuries were recently analyzed and yielded a surprise in regards to just how extensive the medieval trade network in Europe was. The books mostly originated from Clairvaux Abbey in northern France, and it was suspected for some time that something was unusual about the leather they were bound in. It turns out the bindings were actually sealskin and originated a long way from France. The source for the sealskin could have been harbor seals from Scandinavia or even Scotland, but it's also possible it was harp seals from Iceland or even Greenland. The DNA testing wasn't that clear, but they were certainly seals not indigenous to France. And there certainly was historic contact between Scandinavia and Greenland, further than that actually in Newfoundland. This is a clue to a far more vast trade network during the medieval period than was previously known. But I'm not so sure that should be surprising. Human trade networks tend to be extensive, and today they are more extensive than ever. Humans like to trade and move around. And there are even accounts from Scotland and the islands of people spotting what were probably Inuit peoples from presumably Greenland off the coast in their kayaks dating back to the 17th century, possibly because of the Little Ice Age advancing the ice pack at the time. 
I hope the Inuit fishermen made it back safely after that journey with their catch, but one wonders if there are other folk tales of this nature from Scotland or Greenland that are not well known. Scots, Greenlanders, first people of eastern or northern Canada, do let me know. Number 7. The First Sunscreen Lotion About 41,000 years ago, Earth underwent the Le Champ event. This was a geomagnetic excursion that happened during the last glacial period that seems to have had detrimental effects on humans. Basically, the magnetic field weakened temporarily, increasing the amount of ultraviolet light the surface of the Earth was receiving. It's even been suggested that it might have contributed to the extinction of the Neanderthals. This was probably only an issue regionally, but it seems that the humans that were around in those days found ways to adapt. Homo sapiens had a history of being able to make clothing and maybe even use red ochre literally as sunscreen, like we'd use sunscreen today. Whereas it's unclear what the Neanderthals were doing still, but it seems not so much, which left them at a disadvantage, though it has to be said they were also busy merging with Homo sapiens at the time through interbreeding. There was contact, and the Neanderthals were intelligent and complex, and may have been doing that as well. At the same time here, though, a single discovery can and has, in the past, revolutionized how we view Neanderthals. Actually, often in recent years, and that could well happen again. The view is now moving towards them being far more complex than what was thought. It's unclear as to the extent that humans were using ochre for sunscreen. We just know they did because many, many cultures within humanity have practiced body ochre painting with it if they had access. Maybe they had a different use than we thought in the past to ward off the effects of the sun. Anyway, as someone that can sunburn at the drop of a hat and have many times, I found it an interesting hypothesis. But I think we need to know more about the Neanderthals for this one and how early Homo sapiens used and needed sunscreen. Number 6. Uranus's day is longer than we thought. It's actually surprisingly difficult to accurately figure out the rotation rate of the giant planets of the solar system. This is especially true with Uranus because that planet is very weird. Its magnetic field is offset 59 degrees from north for unknown reasons and it's knocked on its side, off a normal solar system rotation axis. This made it very difficult to determine its day accurately because the only really good data on Uranus before the last decade or two was the Voyager 2 flyby in 1986. The best anyone can do from that data, including magnetic field data and auroras, was estimate that Uranus's day was 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds, with a margin of error of over 30 seconds. Now that has been nailed down more accurately, and it turns out it was off by 28 seconds longer, using modern methods over a thousand times more accurate than what was previously done. This was also done with magnetic field data and aurora observations from Earth. And while there is still a margin of error, it won't be as bad as it was because Uranus's actual position and its rotation would go significantly off in just a few years. Whereas with the new measurements, it will remain accurate for at least several decades before offset becomes apparent and will be in need of further revision. Number 5. The Dinosaurs May Not Have Been Circling the Drain For a number of years now, the general view in paleontology was that while the dinosaurs' major extinction event was due to the asteroid strike, they were overall in a period of decline, meaning that they were circling the drain anyway before the asteroid hit. But this is now being rethought because a drop in fossil evidence does not necessarily mean that a group of animals is actually going extinct. This problem was known about. There is something in paleontology called a Lazarus taxon, where a taxon will completely disappear from the fossil record for a long period, only to reappear later in the record and affirm that the taxon never went extinct. Related, there is also in paleontology something called an Elvis taxon. Here you think you're looking at a Lazarus taxon re-emerging, but in fact, you are actually seeing something completely different that just evolved a similar form due to convergent evolution. Thus, it's not unlike an Elvis impersonator, assuming that Elvis himself did not fake his demise, lest he himself be a Lazarus taxon of sorts. Lazarus performer, maybe. You decide on the nomenclature. Recent work at the University College London analyzed a sample of 8,000 fossils from four types of dinosaurs in conjunction with data on geology and water at the time, and they concluded that the real reason for the drop in fossils is that the geology and distribution of the dinosaurs in those days 
just wasn't suitable any longer for widespread preservation, and that the dinosaurs probably were not on their way out, excepting of course the birds, which were definitely on their way up. The dinosaurs just weren't fossilized as well as in other periods. At the same time though, there is also evidence that new species of dinosaur during their later period were appearing slower than the overall normal extinction rate well before the asteroid, so it may still be that the dinosaurs were on the way out, regardless of whether they were preserving as widely as they once did in the fossil record. Number 4. An Innovative New Way to Power a Moon Base one of the challenges of eventually establishing a human moon base is that you really need to bring a lot of stuff with you to do it. Even just a short trip like the Apollo missions required the astronauts to look everything they needed to function with them all the way from Earth. This has led to many ideas of just how to use the moon's resources to limit what we need to bring from Earth, such as using water ice accumulated in permanently dark lunar craters all the way to making concrete from the lunar regolith. One major issue, however, is power generation, and there has been a breakthrough on that front. A team at the University of Potsdam in Germany has developed a solar cell that can be made from melted lunar regolith, basically moon glass. What they did was melted synthetic regolith and coupled it with a crystal known as halide perovskite to create an energy generating solar cell that yielded 12% efficiency from unpurified lunar glass, which is good considering. This type of solar cell created under ideal conditions on Earth is about 26% efficient, and with improvements to the process on the Moon, this technology could eventually reach that goal. The perovskite would still need to be transported from Earth, but not much of it. Just a kilogram per 400 square meters of panel would be needed, and not having to purify the glass is a major advantage as well. You basically just need a curved mirror to concentrate sunlight, and you can melt the regolith and the same technique also applies to Mars eventually, or anywhere where you have sufficient sunlight and accessibility to silicate rocks, such as asteroids, or potentially even Mercury. Though I'm not sure anyone will choose to colonize that planet anytime soon, if ever. Not a lot of upsides to that, but there is a balance. More on that in a future video. Number 3. Early Animals Could Survive Out of Water, Limitedly Fossils collected in Canada in the 1990s, but left largely unexamined from the Cambrian period, have yielded clues that life as early as 498 million years ago had the ability to spend short periods of time on land. These would have been some of the earliest animals, and they appear to have had the toolkit to deal with the stressors of being out of the ocean that early. The rocks in question show evidence of cracks in shale, which indicates that they formed from mudflats that dried out. It seems that the mud was submerged most of the time, with only periods of being exposed to air, but numerous species left fossils indicating that they probably survived this environment, including marine worms and animals like a spiny type of slug-like species. These types of fossils have been found before, but in sediments from much deeper in the water, so that did not speak to their ability to live outside of water, but these new shallow or mudflat shale fossils do. This still goes on today, there are quite a number of marine species alive today that can tolerate brief periods out of water. Number 2. An Artificial Electrical Brain Synapse This entry is potentially a good thing, but as often happens with good things in technology, it carries scary implications. So brains in general can have different kinds of connections between synapses. The common one in mammals are neurotransmitters, which is chemically largely, though obviously does involve electricity. But there are also electrical connections that happen in biology with proteins, called connexons. It's no secret that a number of mental health conditions in humans happen when there is a problem with the neurotransmitter system. Researchers recently asked if you could bypass the neurotransmitter system with the protein system. That actually happened some time ago with a nematode. But here the target was mice, mammals. They searched the catalog of connexin proteins to find one that would be suitable to replace a neurotransmitter in a mouse, and found one from a species of fish that would work. Basically they looked at anxiety and anger reactions to map out the electrical map of the mouse's brain, and how it changed, which led them to an idea where to place the new protein-based synapse bridging the gaps between the neurons, 
and used an attenuated virus to deliver the genetic information needed to produce the connexins. The result was that it changed the flow of electricity through the mouse's brain and changed its behavior. This actually led to a more sociable mouse with less anxiety. If this scales up to humans, big if. But it's not hard to see the potential for medical treatment for people with mental illness. And we already do that with various drugs, such as those for OCD, but there's no question that changing how people think can get out of hand with advanced enough technology. Number 1. Visiting Apophis On a perhaps lighter note, an asteroid that once had a non-zero chance of hitting Earth, blown out of proportion in some ways really, but the threat did exist, now will not hit Earth on 13th April 2029. But it will come close, just 32,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth at its closest. But that's not enough to hit us. But it is closer than a geosynchronous satellite. But what it does do is give us an extremely close asteroid to head out and take a quick look at. This is once in every few thousand years stuff here. So everyone from NASA, ESA, and JAXA are all readying missions to chase it down, all in coordination. Apophis is only 450 meters long so not a huge asteroid to begin with. But the close aspect is really close inside the orbit of geostationary satellites. If you're in Europe or Africa during the encounter, if you have clear skies, you should be able to see it fly by in 2029. The reason to take a look at Apophis is to see what its structure is like. That's important scientifically, but also practically, because asteroids like this litter near Earth orbits, and deflecting them at some point may be needed and it helps to know what they are made out of and how strong they are. Which will be important information to have so you don't deflect it, but accidentally shatter it uselessly to the same effect as a full-on impact. Interestingly, as Apophis passes, it will be affected by Earth's gravity in the form of tidal forces. So there should be seismic activity to study as it passes that could reveal much about its structure. One of the experiments is already in space. The repurposed OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission is still operating, and while it can no longer take samples, it can do a rendezvous with its remaining instruments. The rest of the missions are in development. If they come to fruition, seismic data from the surface of the asteroid will be key, and there may yet be more since this encounter is close enough for CubeSats. But 2029 is already set up to be a scientifically interesting year indeed. Thanks for listening, I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently addressing the fact that there was no discoveries list for May, and it was due to the gardening. Blame the cucumbers, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.